This is Gareth Southgate, and this is the Three Lions Podcast. And welcome to the Three Lions Podcast. My name's Russell Osborne, and in the first of a series of podcasts, I'm hoping to take a look back at previous European Championships that England have participated in. Now, the first two European Championships took place in 1960 and 1964, in France and Spain, respectively. England didn't take part in either. It was 1968 in Italy, two years after that famous World Cup win, when the Three Lions first entered the Thray. Back then, the tournament wasn't anything like we know it as today. 1968 had four nations in it. Hosts Italy, Yugoslavia, ourselves and the Soviet Union. The format was two semi-finals, a final and a third and fourth place, all played across three Italian cities, Florence, Rome and Naples. England were drawn against Yugoslavia in their semi-final. It was played in Florence on the 5th of June, and they went down by a goal to nil, which meant we would go on to the third place playoff, and Yugoslavia went on to the final to play hosts Italy, whilst we faced the Soviet Union. The final between Italy and Yugoslavia ended one all after going to extra time. And so without going to penalties, two days later, they met again. Again in the Stadio Olimpico in Rome. And this time the Italians winning 2-0. England's game with the Soviets thankfully ended in a victory. 2-0 to England, thanks to goals from Bobby Charlton, and Jeff Hurst, either side of half-time, which meant we finished in third place. But for a four-team tournament to have five games, it's no wonder the tournament has changed in its format over the years. In fact, Italy played three games in this tournament and only won one, as their first against the Soviet Union ended nil-nil again after extra time. But the winner there was determined by a coin toss. The next time England travelled to the European Championships was 1980, as we didn't qualify for Belgium in 1972 or Yugoslavia in 1976. So 1980 is where our journey of podcasts begin. It was the first tournament for England since the World Cup in 1970. UEFA actually decided that either England or Italy would host the finals back in 1977. In November of that year, they decided on Italy, because England had hosted the World Cup back in 1966. So Italy qualified automatically as hosts. Now for 1980, England qualified as winners of Group 1, ahead of Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Bulgaria and Denmark. And they'd done it by not losing a game. Beat Denmark 4-3. They drew with the Republic of Ireland 1-0. Beat Northern Ireland 4-0. 3-0 away to Bulgaria. And we beat Denmark at home 1-0. Northern Ireland by five goals to one away. A significant game in this qualifying campaign saw England beat Bulgaria 2-0, which was Glenn Hoddle's debut and a game he scored a debut goal in. And then the final game in qualifying, we beat the Republic of Ireland by two goals to nil. And Kevin Keegan, instrumental in helping us get there, because he scored seven goals in qualifying. It was a new tournament format. It now featured eight teams in two groups of four. And the winners of each group would meet in the final. There were no semi-finals, but both group runners-up played for third and fourth place. And this was the last tournament with that third place game. England were drawn in group two alongside Belgium, Italy 
and Spain. And at the time, we were managed by Ron Greenwood. And this was his chosen squad of 22 players. Ray Clements, Phil Neal, Kenny Sampson, Phil Thompson, Dave Watson, Ray Wilkins, Kevin Keegan, who was playing over for Hamburg in Germany at the time, Steve Koppel, David Johnson, Trevor Brookin, Tony Woodcock, who was the only other player playing his trade abroad, again in Germany, like Kevin Keegan, uh, but Woodcock was playing for Cologne. Viv Anderson, Peter Shilton, Trevor Cherry, Emlyn Hughes, Mick Mills, Terry McDermott, Ray Kennedy, Glenn Hoddle, Paul Mariner, Gary Bertles, and Joe Corrigan. So, let's talk to someone who was there who has a very interesting story. I'd like to welcome to the Three Lions podcast, Les Gasson, an England supporter who who was at Euro 1980 in Italy. And I'm pleased to say he's going to share some of his memories from that tournament with us. Les, hello. Nice to meet you at last. Likewise. Yeah. 1980, 40 years yeah. ago. I'm, I'm hoping you've, uh, your memory um, stretches back that far and you can, can share some of those highlights with me. Yeah, so I mean, um, where do I start really? Right from the beginning, we used to, me and my mates, we used to go out from Hastings, we used to go to Wembley all the time, watch England. Uh, never even thought about going to an away game before and then, the Euros popped up, we qualified, and uh, we all said we would go. So uh, we, in them days, obviously, there was no internet and that type of thing. So how did you go about doing it? it was There was a lot of an advertisement, I think, in one of the programmes, Wembley programmes, for a company that was doing official tours, okay. 15 days out in Italy, touring around uh, wherever England played, uh, and including tickets right up to the final, if you were a member of the travel club. So was um, there a, a travel club back then of sorts? Yeah, um, I've still got my original card, funny enough. <laughs> uh, I, I got it in 1979 purely so we could go to the Euros and get tickets. But one by one, everybody started to drop out. And I ended up sort of like it was just me. So I had to ring up the company and say, look, uh, I'm on my own now. Can I still go? And that was literally what I said to them on the phone. Didn't and daunt you being on your own. I was sharing with somebody and uh, I was game. So, yeah. yeah, signed up, paid the money. I even remember the price. It was 365 quid wow. for 15 days, uh, which was quite a lot of money then. I think I was on about uh, £70 a week, something like that, working. And, uh, yeah, it was quite expensive, but one hell of a trip, it, uh, as it turned out. So, uh, yeah. My girlfriend and uh, mate took me up to the airport, Gatwick, and there's a few other England lads there. A couple in, who stuck out like sore thumbs in particular. There was one, I don't think he'll mind me saying his name, uh, Dougie Foster. He was a QPR skinhead fan. He had his jeans, lovely polished boots, Crombie on, uh, braces, the Ben Sherman shirt. He, lo- he looked the business. He, uh, quite a neat looking chap. Very of the my- time. Stay away from people like that. <laughs> and uh, the rest is history, as they say. Uh, we became quite friendly, and uh, and it all sort of like really uh, kicked off the first night. So, um, but no, it was it was uh, yeah, we we all shut it off. We flew to Genoa, got picked up in a coach, get on the coach, and uh, sat down. And the blokes were coming on saying, "Who are you with?" Anybody sat there? Said, "No, I'm on my own." And nobody could believe I was actually on my own especially in them days. I don't know how many people went on their own in them days. But, um, you know, it really started from there where you hear the phrase quite often, you know, you're never alone when you're away with England and never a truer word spoken because uh, I was looked after very well by loads of lads, West Ham uh, in particular, Spurs, and a, and a group of lads from Torquay United, funny enough, right. who uh, I made great friends with and one of them is... Uh, godfather of my uh, of my son still and we still wow. meet up every now and again so uh, but that's how it really all started um, but what had happened was they took us to a place called Chelly Ligure 
on the Italian Riviera. As uh, a little fit, like a little fishing village, really, little resort, nice beach, and uh, they had about three hotels full of England fans, and they got us all together the first evening to meet and greet, and uh, we all had a good laugh. And then a couple of hours later, we all wandered down into the village by the sea, and all hell broke loose. Basically, no, uh, there was all sorts going on. Apparently, all the local youths and gangs from the surrounding villages and towns came in for, a, should we say, a meet and greet. <laughs> and, uh, they, they were greeted by the likes of Dougie and his mates and everybody else and all the West Ham lads. And uh, it just all kicked off. Next thing you know, it's with the, the place is full of Carabinerian police whacking everybody. And uh, they went into the hotel, the local hotel, where a lot of England fans were. They were throwing their bags out the windows into the street and all sorts. It was absolutely chaotic mess. It's quite scary, really. And uh, the next thing I know, uh, the bloke I was with, um, Nigel from Torquay, said um, the Arsenal chap has just been whacked by one of the police, and he was going to be just about to arrest him. And I just, I just uh, like turned around and put my hand up to the policeman and said, well, "He's done nothing wrong." Next thing I know, I've got a gun on me forehead. No, literally, yeah, he stuck a gun right against me forehead, and I was arrested. And, uh, got taken about 50 yards up the street and, and uh, thrown into this building down a few stairs. But you'd done nothing. Done nothing wrong. It's one of those situations where no one would ever believe you, of course. Yeah. But it's wrong place, wrong time, naivety, call it what you like. But uh, to put my hand up like uh, to the policeman and say that this chap's done nothing wrong was the worst thing I could have done. But it got a little bit worse. Oh, uh, right. There was 11 of us down there, sat on the floor against the wall uh, with armed police overlooking us. And this uh, chap came in in a light blue suit and uh, obviously a plain clothes cop or whatever, some, some of the official. And when he walked in, I just stood up and said, look, we've done nothing wrong again. <laughs> and he just slapped me around the face and I went down again. So uh, that was it. We was arrested, taken into the local police station and uh, put into a big room in with these West Ham lads and Chelsea lads <clears throat> and Spurs. And it was quite scary, really. Uh, I and, bet. Uh, because these lads were a little bit more, shall we say, uh, schooled in going England away and, and football away. And they were saying they've heard stories about what the police do and what the Italian police do. This is we're not going to leave the room uh, individually. And uh, so they literally, honestly, they barricaded the door so no one could get in. And the police were outside banging on the door, shouting and bawling. And um, and I just I thought this is this is getting out of order. And it just went on for about a half an hour. And then we got um, they got the courier, a girl called Sandra from the mm. uh, tour operator. She was good as gold. She was brought into the police station, and she sort of knocked on the door and said, "Look, you know what do you want?" And, we, and the lads were saying, "We'll come out two at a time." We won't come out individually because we know what will happen. And she was sort of like muttered a few things with the police. She could speak a bit of Italian. And then she said, that's OK. You come out two at a time. All they want to do is just interview you, take your details, and then they're going to take you back to your hotels. Went, OK, that's fair enough. And so we went out two at a time. I went out with this big Chelsea lad. I was about in, the, in that third pair. And we sat down. They took our details and everything else. Without us realising, they'd already been to our hotel and taken raided our rooms and taken our passports, which we found ah. out later. But we gave them our details, and they sort of waved us away. This, these cop, two coppers come with us to put us in a police car to uh, allegedly, allegedly take us to our hotel. So we thought that was okay. So we got into the police car, we sat in the back. Two coppers get in the front. One of the passenger seat turns round waves his gun at us again oh. and uh, then puts it on the dashboard and taps it and looks around and smiles. We thought, oh, okay. <laughs> Cheeky. <laughs> and uh, then we drove off. Well, we drove off, tried to drive off. We come out of the compound and there was just hundreds and hundreds of Italians all outside baying for our blood. They were banging and kicking the car and kicking the windows and they just sort of creeped, crept through and got out and then sped us along the, uh, the seafront. Scary. 
It was extremely scary, yeah. And how old was I? I was just tw- I was twenty two, so you know, I, was, I wasn't uh, I wasn't a teenager, but I was still mm. relatively young, and definitely, obviously, uh, inexperienced and naive. But um, <clears throat> no, they, they drove us along the seafront at great speed along these windy roads. Went for about twenty minutes or so, or something like that. Pulled up in this town on this little side street, and we thought, "What the hell is going on? We're supposed to go back to our hotel." We thought we were going to get a kick in and then get left in the streets, which is what we've heard that happens over there. But uh, they got us out, handcuffed, and uh, they knocked on the door of this building. And this chap come with a sort of, uh, he had his uh, pyjama bottoms on <laughs> and a tunic, his hat. So <laughs> I got woken up because it was early, this was early hours in the morning. Right. And um, anyway, took us inside and it was a bloody police, police station. Um, take you from one to another. Uh, Time. Yeah, there's another police station along the coast. And uh, we put in these cells individually, and then that was it. There was like a, there was a fold-down bed off against the wall, a couple of blankets which felt like someone had been eating 50 slices of toast in, <laughs> and a, a bucket chained to the wall, and that was it. Nice. No, and no light. So we was in there, and we were sort of like talking to each other through the walls, me and this Chelsea lad. And then uh, time went by, time went by. No wash, no drink, nothing to eat. We could hear the town waking up outside, uh, but we couldn't really see anything. We could just see a movement. And then it went through and through and through. And we were banging on the doors and saying, like, what's going on? And then nobody came. And then um, it got to the next night. There was another night there. We had nothing to eat, nothing to drink, nothing. No. Uh, and, uh, so the next day, we got a, a visit from Sandra again. Sandra uh, bought us in a can of Coke each and a packet of wafer biscuits. Never forget it. That's all we had uh, in that in that period of time. And Two days. That, that, was, that was the second day. So we've been in there for about 36 hours without any wash, eat or drink. And then we got the, the can of Coke and a packet of wafer biscuits. That, that was from Sandra. And then uh, we, we had to stay there again. And then we got taken out. Was handcuffed again, taken into a police police car and driven a bit further down the coast to a place called Savona, uh, where we were taken to a prison building. It was only then that we realised we weren't alone. It was just, it was all eleven of us that had been arrested and taken to different places. So it was a bit of a relief to meet up with all the other lads. So we were like uh, processed, you know, photographs, fingerprints, all that sort of stuff, mm. and then. Um, we were told to sit in this room, and Sandra was there, which was good. And we said, look, what's going on? And she said, well, you're going to be interviewed by the prosecutor, and then from there they'll decide what's going to happen. Um, so we, one at a time, we got taken into this room, big oak table, big oak chair, this bloke sitting there, all official, and a couple of carabinieri there with machine guns and uh, swords by their <laughs> swords and all that, and it was like... Uh, quite intimidating and he was asking us these questions with interpreter saying you know what did you do what was you doing this and the other and so we haven't done anything wrong you know and and he was just banging on the desk calling us liars apparently that lasted about five or ten minutes and then we got taken back to the room again and we waited about half an hour and sandra came in and uh, we said what's happening and she said well you're gonna have to go to court i said you're joking and she said yep you've got to go to court i said when's that and she said that's when she got a little bit tense. She said it could be a few weeks, it could be a few months. I said, oh, so what are we going to do till then? She says, you've got to stay here. That is, that's when my bottom lip went. <laughs> oh, I bet. <laughs> and, uh, that, that, was, that was quite scary. For crikey. Anyway, we got whisked off again, back to this place where we were kept before along the coast. And they let us go in together in a, in a, single, in a single cell, which you know means we could have a bit of a laugh with each other. But it was a bit, it was very scary. And then the next day, we got called out and we got stood up. And by then, you know, we were on our third day and beshevelled a little bit, unwashed, uh, same clothes on, everything. We still had nothing else to eat or drink. That was all we had was that what we had the day before. We got stood up and this chap came in, grey suit, uh, introduced himself in very good English and said he was the uh, British vice consul from Turin. He's come to see uh, how we are and what's what's going on and uh, what he can do for us. 
and uh, there was a big army looking chap there about six foot four all the regalia on big long sword all the fruit salad on his side mm-hmm. very important looking chap and uh, he was interpreting chap in the suit was interpreting for us and uh, he said uh, how are they treating you and we looked at each other thinking <laughs> do we tell the truth or do we uh, do we be nice so we we started to get a bit savvy then and we said oh no no problem at all very well thank you you know um and he said, uh, was it too much wine, too much beer? And we said, yeah, yeah, you know, we didn't really do anything wrong, but, you know, he was there and it was all going going pear-shaped. But, you know, we understand what's happening. So this chap was nodding. And then uh, he said, we're going to get you out as quickly as we can. So that was that was a bit of a relief. And literally three hours later, we was out. It was only uh, when we got back to the hotel that we found out that if it wasn't for Sandra lesser yeah. we would have still been in there because it was the tour operator didn't want the bad publicity so right. he refused to get in touch with the consular and that's why i was in there for so long but sandra kept insisting and in the end he, he, the bloke caved in and said okay and then you know literally within hours we was out so she uh, saved your bacon sandra she saved our bacon she's good as gold and i wish i could bump into her again today i mean if she's still around it's uh you know we've got a pic- i got a photograph over here which i will never forget yeah but that was a scary scary time you know and that was the beginning of the trip <laughs> so, so had any games taken place by then no we were lucky we got out two days before the first england game because we was ah. over there quite early there was one chap who got kept in because um he was uh, he got arrested Further up the um, coast, they'd gone to another town, to a club and a, and a restaurant, and he left the restaurant with a with his knife and fork in his hand, you know, just drunk and, you know, being silly. Mm. And they were trying to thumb a lift back to Chelly Ligur. A lorry stopped for them, and, of course, he had this knife in his hand. <laughs> and, and the uh, lorry driver drove off, and next thing you know, they got picked up in a police car. Apparently, the lorry driver said he's try- they tried to hijack him with a knife. <laughs> knife point so he was so that was like um an added an added like uh charge that uh, they had to go through so they had to stay the next couple of days but um no it was quite eventful but the, you know, the whole trip eventually after that it was like uh you know we went to the first game against belgium in turin the infamous tear gas game when uh belgium equalized and all these italians at the uh, by the side of us were spitting and throwing missiles and coins so a big group of West Ham lads and a big Union Jack flag at the back near the near the scoreboard, and they just ran down the terrace and at them and just piled into them. It was uh, so the old school days, wasn't it? Yeah, late seventies, early eighties. So it all kicked off, and the Aussie the Italians legged it, the ones that could, ones that could get away, and then the police come wading in with batons, hitting everybody. I mean, everybody, women, kids. Oh, uh, it was disgraceful. So everybody like legged it away and then we got to the we got to the entrance the exits and there was this big Leeds fan uh, stood on a pedestal I can never forget him he, uh, he was in uh, jean cut downs he had uh, he had boots on and no shirt and he had red white and blue circles uh, painted around his nipples and he was <laughs> a lad he, right. was, he was a monster and he was just say, saying to everybody, we're not running. We're going back and we're going to take on the police. I thought, yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> They're all armed to the teeth with batons and you know, all that sort of stuff and helmets and everything. And uh, But all these lads, honestly, I've never seen anything like it. All these lads just charged back into the stadium and just took the police on and uh, run them, run them across the terrace. And that's why they come in and fired all the tear gas. And, uh, and the game was stopped for about 20 minutes, I think, something like that. Right, so players were being affected by the tear gas as well. Oh. So I managed to get a couple of uh, snaps with my camera. All oh, uh, right, they're not brilliant, but uh, it shows a little bit of the chaos, sort of like the aftermath when the police left, sort of thing, you know. Yeah. But um, that's about all I got. So uh, that was that was that the game was against like, Belgium. Wasn't that was it, the where? game against Belgium in Turin. Yeah. So Ray uh, Ray Wilkins scored a uh, pretty smart goal that one I've seen on YouTube. Did. Yeah, he did. Yeah. And we scored another one, which was disallowed as well. Uh, we should have won two one. Oh, okay, so, well that that would have changed the whole complexity of the uh, yeah of, of the group, I guess, wouldn't it? 
because we weren't a bad side. You know, we we didn't have anything going for us. Look, a lot of times we don't get things going for us, do we? But yeah. um, no, it was uh, end up one all, and of course the next game was Italy and Turin <laughs> at the so same stadium, same ground. Then, so you knew yeah. you knew the layout and you knew the potential of of what yeah. could happen. And I guess I guess there'd be a lot more Italians there this time. Well, that was the, that was the thing. Two days before the game, uh, the tour operators got us all together in the hotel again for a meeting and said, um, right, so this is the situation. They said, uh, the next game in Turin against Italy, the hosts, there's going to be 70,000 Italians after baying after your blood. We advise you not to go. But if you insist on going, we are obliged to take you. But we can't take you by coach because the uh, coach uh, company has been firebombed, petrol bombed. <laughs> so um, they refuse to go anywhere near the ground or take any England fans anywhere. So uh, we all sort of like said, well, you know, this is what we come for. So we're going to go. And they said, if, we could, if you go, we're going to have to take you by train. So we thought, that's okay. And that was the best thing that could happen, actually, uh, Russell, because um, what that did was it put everybody together in Turin railway station because every train that turned up was full of England fans coming from all directions and the Carabinerian police held everybody in. So you can imagine this massive great railway station co uh, complex yeah. just awash with about, I don't know, anywhere between four or 5,000 England fans um, all together. There's nobody's going to touch you, uh, especially in them days with the sort of lads that used to be around. Safety in numbers there. <laughs> Big numbers, and we got a, a Carabinieri uh, water cannon escort all the way to the ground. And you didn't see an Italian at all until we got to the ground. The police Carabinieri mounted away, and it was dark, but it was a free for all. And it was the scariest thing I've ever been in. You literally thought you was going to die. You could die. It was that bad. There was fights everywhere. There was Italians running around with sticks, with nails sticking out of them, knives, everything. So we sort of like, with the tall key lads, sort of like ushered ourselves into the, um, through the first turnstile, into the compound outside the actual stadium itself. So for a bit of safety, but it was still going off in there. You couldn't get onto the terracing because they were uh, chucking coins and anything they could get their hands on, bottles of piss, everything, excuse my French. But uh, they was even peeing off the top, there was no roof. So oh. they was even peeing off the top, wherever they could. And then... There was all hell broke loose when this um, ambulance came in. There was two people carrying this lad, and there was lots of shouting and bawling going on. Is he English? Is he Italian? You know, that sort of thing. Someone said he's Italian, and they were carrying him by his arms and his legs. He'd been stabbed in the chest. Oh. Um, he had blood coming out of his chest and out of his mouth. We thought, Christ, he's a goner. He doesn't look well at all. And it was very, very scary. And Ooh. it was the, the uh, atmosphere was that bad that the people were still trying to get at him and kick him uh, while he was being carried. And that's how bad it was. So, But eventually we managed to get into the, into the ground. And once we, once we got in en masse, then uh, you had a little uh, thin line of uh, police. The Italians didn't really, apart from waving and gesturing like they always do, no. they didn't do anything else after that. And we ended up losing the game 1-0. Marco Tardelli, I think. Yeah, I mean, this was a couple of years before he uh, really staked his claim in the World Cup, wasn't it? Yeah, but that basically put us out because we drew the first one, lost the second one. Yeah. So the third game down in Naples was a bit of a dead rubber. So, so. do you reckon the players, the players knew what was going on? Were they affected by it? I think they did because there was an awful lot in the papers at the time and we had the newspapers ringing our hotels all the time and we was under strict orders, don't speak to anybody because we were... Persona non grata going down through Italy. Uh, we were due to stop uh, on the way down to Rome, where we were stopping next. We were due to stop in Florence for the night, but the hotel wouldn't take us. And then we heard that the hotel in Rome wouldn't take us. But the owner of the hotel in Celli was a family member of the same hotel chain. Right. So uh, he put a good word in for us because he knew that we was okay. We, he knew there was we were no problem. It was good as gold. So he managed to persuade the owner to to uh, let us in. But we weren't very welcome, shall we say, put it that way. If you wanted to get served at the bar, it took quite a long time. And right. It was always last right. if there was locals around. Nice hotel, outskirts of Rome, five-star hotel, which was really good. But we went down there and then we went on from there to the Naples game against Spain. 
it was 2-1 to England. Uh, Trevor Brookian got the opener. Spain then equalised and, and Tony Woodcock got the got the winner there. But it wasn't enough though, was it? No, no, no. It, it was pretty much a dead rubber for us. We, we was already knocked out. We had no, we had no chance. I think we, I think Italy had to lose or something like that in their game for us to go through. But uh, so yeah, that was a bit of a shame. Uh, and you know, we saw a few sites. You no, know, we had we had uh, six days in Rome. We we saw Pompeii. You know, did all that sort of stuff. So it, it was quite good. And you got no trouble, sort of away from the football. Everyone was was good there in knowing that. No, you were we didn't. No, the only trouble we had was the the first night in Chile when it all went pear shaped. But there was trouble uh, all over. In particular, there was a massive amount of West Ham fans there that were, uh, should we say, at the forefront of most of it, I think. As far as I remember, I think there was five deaths during the um, Euros, as far as I'm aware. There was uh, a couple of, uh, at least one West Ham fan, I think, uh, got run over by a coach. Some people say it was deliberate. I don't know. It was a rumour. Another one was run over a, a crevasse or something he, in the dark. He was chased, and I think there was a uh, three Italians were, were killed. Really, in oh. trouble. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. It was very a very nasty atmosphere around. Very nasty atmosphere. That was of. It is pretty good to Italy, though. I'm afraid it still is now. So. Yeah, for football at the time was was like that. Thankfully, it's not so not so bad. Yeah, it's now. not from our side anyway. We still have to watch out for ourselves when we go to certain places, but. Um, you know the England fans now, as you know, there's lads to go, and there's a, a new wave of youth, should we say, uh, who are starting to on the easy jet games, as we call them, mm-hmm. uh, turn up on mass with their Stone Island stuff on and that, and they just play up really. They don't really cause it. It's all uh, storm of the teacup stuff, really. It's not organised thuggery like it used to be back in the seventies and eighties. So no, even no. the nineties. That's all. That's all pretty much disappeared now. So the journey came to an end after Naples then, did it, and you safely yeah, back home? Yeah, we, we were there for the full tournament for 15 days because the tournaments were quite short in them days. It was only two weeks. So, yeah, we had tickets for the uh, for the final and that. So we went to the final, Germany, Belgium, in Rome. Uh, uh, okay. And then uh, flew home from there, really. So did that have an atmosphere, Germany against Belgium? Um, yeah, it was um, – obviously, everyone was supporting Belgium yeah. against the Germans – but it's a funny thing was there was a load of Dutch in town as well, and they were trying to pick a fight uh, on the way into the ground when he was walking across the bridge. They were all trying to pick a fight with the English. No one really wanted to know. I think we were all like uh, knackered by then and couldn't be asked. We had nothing. We had no vested interest in it. We just wanted to see Belgium win, but lost two 0 or two one. I think Belgium. Yeah. And no, was, there was no real nastiness as such. So, so generally good good memories apart from that initial start. It was a bad start, it, you know. It didn't. It was very bad for a few days, and then, uh, you know, then after that, it was a, a fantastic trip in the sunshine, you know, with with some really top lads. Some, I mean, really top lads. It was a, quite a good opener for me, really. It really uh, set me on my way. I was always determined to go to as many games as possible after that. So uh, I didn't mind if I went on my own. Well, it certainly didn't put you off, and and you're still going today. Yeah, I've been retiring for ten years, <laughs> <laughs> trying to. Going to my missus. Yeah, I, I felt like giving it up, and I was at work one day, and I didn't. I purposely didn't go to a game. I thought I'll give it a go. I won't go. I can't remember what game it was. It was about five or six years ago, and I sat at work when the, the day of the game, and my phone was pinging. The messages were coming through. Uh, are you out here yet? What bar are you in? Give us a shout when you arrive, and all that sort of stuff. And I'm thinking, what the hell am I doing sat here in an office? with all these numpties and I could be out there enjoying myself, you know. So that was it. I, I said, I'm, I'm not going to retire. I don't see the point. Uh, all the while you go and enjoy your trips. Do them in a slightly different way now. I mean, I take the wife now and again yeah. when she's got holiday. We make holidays of it wherever we can. So, you know, we're getting a bit older now. So a bit more, well, I'd say a little bit more mature. <laughs> but, uh, no, it's good fun. Uh, I love meeting up with the lads, all different people from all over the country. I was saying, I've been to four England weddings now, so we're meeting oh. people abroad with England. They're all top lads, same faces we see every trip. So, yeah, we'll keep it going. Looking forward to at least one trip away next in the Euros next year. Yeah, um, let's, let's hope that's so. That's a bit of a nightmare to try and plan. You can't plan it, can you? You don't know where you're going to be. Just the um, caveat to the uh, Italy away thing, though. Obviously, we came home and forgot all about it. 
what went on. But in um, November that year, I got a letter, a registered post uh, f- from Italy. It was a it was a summons to go to court. We just ignored it basically. Thought well, I'm not going over there. Yeah. Don't trust them. So I just ignored it and uh, thought nothing else of it. Year '87, we we planned a trip to go to Yugoslavia for right. one game in '87. Uh, but just about three weeks before we went, I got a letter. We drove down through France, Monaco, just fingers crossed when we crossed through uh, the Italian border into uh, Yugoslavia that way. So didn't stop us at the border when we showed our passports, so that was okay. Again, thought nothing of it, and uh, it went to court. 81, I got the letter about the summons, and it actually went to court in 1987. And we got a letter just before we went away in 87 to say that we've been found guilty in our absence oh. and we've got a suspended sentence or something and costs and it come up to about 65 quid in costs <laughs> which I've totally ignored since as well and I haven't even paid the 65 pound if I get a parking fine or a speeding ticket in Italy I suppose they might look me up but I don't know you've had no trouble since going over there no I've been to Italy quite a few times and I think it, I think it would only pop up if at all if I ever got stopped for any reason and they check my details yeah, but there you go. You know, I mean, that's one of hundreds of stories, I suppose. See if you can ever find out um, if anybody knows Mr. Douglas Foster, QPR fan from Euro eighty. I've, yeah. I've tried many ways to try and find out uh, whether he's still around or alive or or whatever, because he's one of the chaps I'd uh, love to bump into again. And say hello. We're called the Chirling U eleven. <laughs> okay, yeah, I bet. <laughs> we still got the uh, documents uh, from from that, so I've uh, yeah. got one. The first one's framed because it lists all the names, ah, and okay, so names and addresses of all eleven of us, and uh, yeah. it's uh, no, it's it's one of those things where you know, tongue in cheek, you sort of look back on and think we were boys then, weren't we? Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got to where we got away. We were lucky, I think. So. Yeah. Thank you for sharing those with us. So yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. Wow, what a story. I'm sure you'll agree. Thanks for listening. I hope it's been of interest and maybe given you an idea of just what it was like to follow England 40 years ago. Now, this is the first of many where it didn't go England's way. Maybe, just maybe this year. Thanks to Les Gasson for his time and memories. Now, I did find the inspiration for this series of Euro podcasts from an England book that Les featured in. It's called England Till I Die. It's edited by David Lane. It's well worth a search. This is the first of a series of England at the European Championships and there are more to come as we find out supporters' experiences of 1988, 1992 and onwards. So stay subscribed and you won't miss them. Don't forget all the previous Three Lions podcasts are available. Just search your podcast provider. Or take a look at threelinespodcast.com. Plus, I'd be grateful if you could leave a little positive review on the likes of iTunes or Spotify. It means that the podcast gets a little more exposure and more people have the opportunity to find it. So until the next time, cheers! Cheers!